So let me pray so that that can happen. Good morning, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are the can-do God, that you're able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, and you do it according to the power that's already worked working within us. We're so glad that nothing is impossible with you, and that fills our hearts and our souls with hope today. We confess to you our sins, those things we did and said and thought we ought not to have, and the things we've left undone, our sins, the sins of our church, the sins of our nation. We thank you that you came to seek and save us. And we thank you that in you we are forgiven. We thank you that you've given us your spirit. We thank you you've given us your word. We thank you we can gather and worship you. We thank you for a beautiful, beautiful day. We are a needy, needy people, and that's why we're here. And you know our needs and meet our needs. And oh, how we pray for revival. Will you not yourself Revive us again that your people may rejoice in you. As we open up your word, spirit, fall fresh and revive us. May lost people be won to you and believers be built and workers be equipped and disciple makers be multiplied so that our community could be filled with the knowledge of Jesus and with the hope that only you bring, Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, a man pulls up to a little league baseball field and he sees a boy sitting in the dugout <clears throat> and he goes and he asks the boy, what's the score? And the, the little boy says, it's 18 to zero, we're behind. And um, the man said, I bet you're discouraged. And the boy said, uh, why should I be discouraged? We haven't even had the chance to get up to bat yet. I love that boy. I mean, they're down 18 to nothing in the first in inning, but he says, we haven't even been up to bat yet. I love hope, don't you? Hope is like oxygen for the soul, isn't it? That when we're filled with hope, we can overcome anything. And yet, when we don't have hope, we can't really do anything, can we? And so the point of today's message, what we're really going to explore today is that Jesus is our living hope. Will you say that with me? Jesus is our living hope. Uh, if you're new, we've just begun a, an adventure of walking through 1 Peter. And so we've learned a few things. We learned who the author is. This is kind of easy. Who's the author? Thank you. The author is Peter. And we learned last week, the audience, that he wrote this letter. And listen, he wrote this letter to Christians who were a persecuted minority living in a hostile culture. We've picked out this book because the audience of this book were Christians living as a persecuted minority in a hostile culture. Do you ever feel that way? That's why we're walking through this. The purpose Peter had in writing it, the purpose we have in this series is we want to equip you to follow Jesus in an increasingly hostile culture. Do you find yourself in a culture that you're, you're not quite sure how to follow Jesus? That's the purpose of this series. We want to equip you to follow Jesus in an increasingly hostile culture. And good news, we want to make disciples together. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, but in the front, in the front of the study, every uh, week there is this disciple-making map. It's the disciple-making map. It's how we're trying to build you up and equip you so you can do the same with others. So when you lead someone to faith in Christ and you want to equip them the way I'm equipping you, there's five questions we need to know the answer from. And we're going to learn them as we walk through 1 Peter. And the first has to do with identity, <clears throat> which answers the question, who am I? And isn't that we looked, what we looked at last week? Who am I? We learned we're chosen, we're called, we're forgiven, we're empowered, we're Christians, we're disciples. That's our identity. And then as we walk through Peter, we'll, we'll answer questions dealing with community. Where do I belong? We'll, we'll answer the question of purpose. Why am I here? We'll answer the question with money. What would Jesus have me to give? And then we'll answer the question about our hope. Our hope, which is, where am I going? Where am I going? And that's the question we're looking at today. Where am I going? So that's where we're going today. We're going to learn that Jesus is our living hope. 
So if you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. And if you don't, you can follow on the screens. But Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There it is. Do you see the living hope? That Jesus is our living hope. So that raises three questions in my mind. And the first question is, what is hope? So we want to uh, answer that. And, and then the next question is, well, what robs us of hope? What is it that, what robs, what steals our hope and fills us with despair? And then I want to answer the question, well, how does Jesus fill us with hope? How does Jesus fill us with hope? So let's go back to the beginning. What is hope? When you hear hope, is your first thought a noun or a verb? Which is it? Hmm? Our culture, our culture uses hope primarily as a verb. It means wishful thinking. I hope my team wins. I hope the weather is good. Um, you know, something like that. Uh, I, I hope. It's, it's a verb. But in the Bible, it's primarily used as a noun. In our passage here, where it talks about that Jesus is a living hope, hope is a noun. It's a noun. It's a certainty. The best definition I've ever heard of hope, this is so good, hope is the joyful expectancy that the best is yet to come. What does it mean that Christ is our hope? It means from the day we meet Christ, every day of our lives, we have the joyful expectancy that the best is yet to come. Many of you are young, maybe that doesn't sound so good, but old people like me so often they look to the past, they think their best days are in the past. What does it mean that Christ is our living hope? It means we live every day of our lives believing that the best is yet to come. Isn't that good? The best is yet to come. So what is our hope? It's the joyful expectancy that the best is yet to come. Well, then the next question, question is what robs us? What steals our hope? What fills our heart with despair? Well, only three things. <laughs> our past, our present, and our future. How, how does our past, how does our past steal our hope? Well, our failures. How can we have a future when we've messed up our lives so much? Our past. And then there's our present. How can we have a future with the futility when life is so hard now? How can we think about the future? And then the future, listen, death is always there laughing at us. So how can we have a future when death awaits us? Okay. So... We've answered the question, what is hope? What robs us of our hope? Now let's come back and say, how does Jesus fill us with hope? How does Jesus fill us with hope? We're dealing with our past. Listen, this is so good. Christ is our living hope, and what that means is our failures are not fatal. Will you say that with me? Our failures are not fatal. One more time. Our failures are not fatal. Have you ever messed up? You ever overwhelmed by your failures? Isn't it good to know that what we mean when we say Christ is our living hope is that our failures are not fatal. Let me show you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Mothers. Mothers, remember? Remember the first time you felt life inside of you? You remember that? When your baby moved inside of you for the first time and you said, there's life inside of me. That's what it means to be born again. Do you remember that? Do you remember what it was like when the Spirit of God caused you to be born again and for the first time in your life you had an awareness of your sin? Wow, I'm a sinner. And for the first time in your life you began to understand the gospel and see the beauty of Christ. Did you feel the Spirit of God moving in you? Do you know that Jesus loves us so much that he sent someone to share the gospel with us? But not only that, but he sent the Holy Spirit to quicken us so we could hear and understand and respond, right? And what is that gospel that he sends? <clears throat> Remember Easter? Remember on Easter how we unpack these verses? For I delivered to you as of first importance. Now, students, some of you are graduating, right? When the teacher says this is of first importance, you know what? You should pay attention, right? For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. You see the word our sins? That's the bad news of the gospel. So important, we all have a problem called sin. We live in a culture that says there's good people and bad people. 
And the gospel says that's not true. The gospel says there's only one good person. His name is Jesus, and the rest of us are flawed, right? We're all flawed. Our sins, not their sins, our sins. The Bible says all of us have sinned against God in thought. <laughs> Do you want the people in here to know what you thought this week? In word. Do you want the people around here to know what you said this week? Indeed, right? God knows, right? See, we've sinned against God. It's not only what we do and say and think, it's what we leave undone. Sin is very personal. We don't break rules. We break God's heart. We sin against God, and the God we sin against is just, and he says what we deserve for what we've done is hell. And when we understand we've sinned against God and, and that we're in big trouble, we say, what do we do? And that's what prepares us for the good news of the gospel. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ, Jesus Christ, is God who became a man, fully God and fully man in one person, who died for our sins. He had no sins. Listen, our sins, our failures are really a big deal. That's, that's why Jesus took them. But, but he took them and, and paid for them so we wouldn't have to. On the cross, he took all of our sins, and, and he died in their place once and for all. When Jesus died on the cross, he cried out, It is finished, meaning he had paid in full the penalty for our sins. He died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried. He really was dead, but you know what was coming, right? And that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He was dead. He was buried. But the third day he rose. And you know what that means? It's the exclamation point on it is finished. How do we know that our sins have been paid for in full? Because the exclamation point is that Jesus walked out of the tomb. And he offers us the greatest gift ever given. The gift of eternal life. And you know what eternal life? It deals with the past. It's the forgiveness of our sins so that we know our failures are not fatal. And you know what, eternal life? It's the opportunity to do life with Jesus so that we realize that our lives are not fatal. And it's the chance to do life with him forever so that we know our death is not final. <laughs> wow. So how do we get this gift? In John 6, verse 47. <clears throat> Will you read this verse with me? Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Now you got my speed. Say it with me, okay? Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. When you see Jesus saying truly, truly, you know what he's saying? Wake up. Wake up. This is important. So in this verse, who does Jesus say has eternal life? Who? So if you believe, what does he say about you? You have eternal life, and you know what that means? Your failures are not fatal. The moment you believe in Jesus, he forgives you of all of your sins, past and present and future. Aren't you glad? Aren't you? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that our failures are not fatal. And you know what that means? That if you've not believed in Jesus, you don't have eternal life. Wouldn't you like to go to bed tonight knowing that you had been forgiven of all of your sins, wouldn't you? The way you can have that experience is by believing in Jesus. And believing in Jesus really is as simple as ABC, where we admit and believe and commit. There was a day in my life where I admitted, Jesus, I've sinned against you, and I'm sorry. And if you've never have done that, won't you do that this day? And I believed. I said, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose, won't you? And I trusted Jesus. I committed myself to him as Savior and Lord. Jesus, come in and forgive me and give me eternal life. And he did, won't you? And I want you to be the Lord of my life and help me be the person you want me to be. And he did. Oh, won't you? Won't you do that before you leave? You can do that right now or... When we close in prayer in a few minutes, I'll give you an opportunity to believe then. But listen to what Jesus said. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Jesus is our living hope because the moment we believe in him, our failures are not fatal. We're forgiven. And that's how Jesus helps us to overcome the past. Our failures are not fatal. But what about the present? What about the present? Listen, in the present, what it means that Jesus is our living hope is that our lives are not futile. Our lives are not futile. Do you ever feel like life is futile? Anybody ever feel that way? You work and work and nothing really comes of it? Oh, l listen, listen to this. We just read about Jesus rising from the dead back in 1 Peter to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith 
for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Know why we experience the futility of life? Because we experience various trials, right? They did, we did, and, and what were those trials? Many of those trials were just the futility of living in a broken, sin-scarred world. Listen, life seems futile, doesn't it? Marriage is hard. Being single is hard. Listen, parenting is hard. Being parented is hard, right? Listen, earning a living is hard, isn't it? Being unemployed is hard. Everything is hard in a broken world because everything is broken. And in addition to that, they were living as, as a persecuted minority in a hostile culture, and sometimes they were overwhelmed. Don't you feel that way too? How about this last year? Anybody find this last year like rather overwhelming? Anybody? You know what it's felt like to me? Uh, <clears throat> growing up surfing, what it felt like to me was I was paddling out surfing during a Northeaster. You ever seen the ocean during a Northeaster? It's just one wave after another wave after another wave. And you know what? All year long I was paddling, paddling, but know what I was doing? I was going backwards. I was making no progress. You know what futility is? Futility is paddling like crazy and going backwards, right? You ever feel that way? Boy, I sure do. Listen. But what Jesus is our living hope means that our lives are not futile. Our lives are not futile even when we're paddling hard and going backwards. So that the proof of your faith may, being more precious than gold, <clears throat> which is imperishable, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining us the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So when we go through this broken world, we go through the same broken world who peop with people who don't know Jesus. But the difference is we have a friend. We have a friend named Jesus who has promised to never leave us, right? When I was reading verse 8, did that sound familiar to you? Did it? Where, where Peter writes, and though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him. Does that sound familiar? For some of you, it does. Remember, remember when Jesus rose from the dead and, and the apostles were gathered together, but Thomas wasn't there. And Jesus came and stood in their midst. And they went and told Thomas, we've seen Jesus alive. And Thomas said, I won't believe unless I see him and touch him. Remember that? So the next Sunday, the next Sunday, listen, the apostles are there and, and and Thomas is with them, and Jesus comes. And remember what happened? Thomas got to touch him. Thomas got to see him. And then in John 20, verse 28, Thomas said, answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. He worshiped Jesus. Now notice he called him my Lord and my God. Uh, if you read the Bible and someone bows down before an angel or a person, what do they always say? What? Get up. Get up. I'm just a creature like you. But when Thomas worshiped Jesus, Jesus accepted worship because Jesus is God made man. So notice, Thomas said, my Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who do not see and yet believe. He was speaking of you. He was speaking of you. Though you've not seen him, you believe in him. Though you've not seen him, you love him. And so as you're walking through a life that so often seems futile, you have a friend who will never leave you, and his name is Jesus. And as he walks with you, he's made you a promise. <laughs> oh, in Isaiah 43, <clears throat> let me read you Isaiah 43 too. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. Did you hear the bad news in that? Did you? That when you, it didn't say what if you, it said when you. When you as a Christian are living here on earth, you're going to go through the waters. You're going to go through the rivers. You're going to walk through the fire. But you know what his promise is? I will be with you. I will be with you. I will be with you. Oh, when life seems so overwhelming, let's remember Jesus is our living hope. And what that means, what that means is, listen, our lives are not futile. He's with me. He's in me. He's for me. 
We have a friend who's with us. Listen, there's also the purpose that he has for our life and even the purpose that he has for our sufferings and our trial. Back to 1 Peter 1, verse 6. In this, you greatly rejoice, even though for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. How can we rejoice in trials? So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you know what happens in trials? The important things become important, right? I mean, in the good times, in the good times, everything seems important, doesn't it? But in the tough times, only the important things seem important. You know what I learned in the last 14 months? That Jesus is our treasure. That's what I've learned. My treasure is Jesus, and I'd rather have Jesus than anything our world affords today. Isn't that true? You know what I learned? That I'd rather have the approval of Jesus than the approval of all the people on earth. Wouldn't you? You know what I've learned? Jesus is our treasure for me and for our culture. And we're here to share that treasure with others because every heart in our culture today longs for Jesus. They long for forgiveness in a bitter, angry culture. We offer people forgiveness. In a culture that's starved for truth, you know what I love about Jesus this last 14 months? You ever said, I just want to know the truth? Wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Get vaccinated, don't get vaccinated. More people are dying than you think, less dying. I just want to know the... Do you know what I get to do with Jesus? I get to open up his word and in a confused culture where I just want to know the truth, I have the truth. Aren't you glad you know him? He's our treasure. He's our treasure. And we get to share that treasure with others. There is truth. And it's, his name is Jesus. You know what else we have? We have hope. Do you ever look around you at our hope-starved culture and know what we have, that Jesus is our living hope, is what hearts are crying out for. And we're here to offer them hope. Ah. Uh, so listen, our lives are not futile because as we go through this life, we have a friend, we have a purpose, and he makes us a promise that, that our suffering is only for a short time. Did you pick that up back in verse 6? In this you greatly rejoice, <clears throat> even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. So many of us, we're going through really, really, really hard times, right? And do you hear what it says? It's just a short time. It's just a short time. And you say, well, how can you say it's short? How can you say, well, in light of eternity, right? I mean, remember like the dot is life here on earth, 70 years, 90 years, and the line is tens of thousands and thousands of years that go on forever. Listen, when we're going through tough times, listen, Jesus says, remember, our suffering here is short. Suffering is short. But listen, our joy will be forever. And to help us in that, the Apostle Paul gives us a great, great word. In Romans 8, verse 18, he writes, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time... Right? Now, I want you to hear that. Paul says in this life there's sufferings. And I want you to know, Paul knew suffering, didn't he? I mean, as a Christian, didn't Paul suffer a lot? Beaten times without number. He was shipwrecked and imprisoned. He was stoned, right? The old-fashioned way, right? He was stoned the old-fashioned way. I think that's funny. Okay, he was stoned. And he was eventually, he would be martyred, right? But all that he went through, he said what? That the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed. You know, Paul not only suffered, he had seen heaven. And he says, God has things in store for you that can enable you to make it through the really tough times, knowing that the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. So listen, um, Jesus is our living hope. He helps us overcome our past because we know our failures are not fatal. He helped us in the present. Our lives are not futile. Our lives are not futile. And he helps us with the future too as we look ahead and there's death, that our death is not final. Our death is not final. Oh. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Listen, Jesus walked bodily out of the grave. He was the first, but he's not the last. We too will rise one day. The best is yet to come. Our best days of physical health are in the future, not in the past. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. You ever see families and they fight over the family inheritance? Isn't it nice to, know, nice to know that you have an inheritance? No one can take it away from you. It's reserved for you. It'll never fade away. It'll be revealed to you in the last time. Uh, <clears throat> will not fade away reserved in heaven for you. Now, I want you to understand something, what your future looks like. If you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, we're not looking back anymore, not in the present, we're looking ahead. If you're a Christian and you look ahead, you know what you see? You see good and then beyond that, you see better. And then when you look beyond that, it's, it's the best. Hey, that's pretty good, isn't it? What does it mean that Christ is our living hope? It means when we look ahead, it looks good, better, and best. Eternal life is good now because we're doing life with Jesus, with a purpose. When we die, it gets better because when we die, we get to go to heaven to be with Jesus. Remember what Jesus told the thief on the cross next to him? He said what? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. That's what will happen when you die. But listen, that's not the best. That's not the best. Something better is coming um, that's reserved in heaven uh, for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Listen, one day soon, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back and heaven is going to come to earth. We're going to rise from the dead. Everything sad and broken in earth on earth will become untrue. In this, looking ahead, you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, um, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you've not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Oh, history is moving toward the day when the party of the ages, when heaven comes to earth and our bodies are raised up, and we spend all of eternity on a new earth. We were made for a person, Jesus. We were made for a place, paradise, paradise on earth, and one day paradise will come to earth, and we will spend all of eternity with Jesus on a new earth. Isn't it great to know that what we look forward to is not 70 years of good health, but thousands and thousands? Isn't it great that we look forward to a day when everything sad and broken about earth will be untrue? That's what it means when we say Jesus is our living hope. So what have we learned? We asked the question, what is hope? And we said that hope is the joyful expectancy that the best is yet to come. We said, what robs us of our hope? Well, our past and our present and our future. And then we looked at how does Jesus fill us with hope? Listen, when it comes to the past, we learned that our failures are not fatal, we're forgiven. When it comes to the present, our lives are not futile. We get to do life with Jesus, with purpose, knowing that suffering is for a short time. Listen, with the future, we realize our death is not final. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. So listen, now we're rounding a turn from what we're learning to what I'd really like for you to do this week. And our action step this week comes right out of the passage. What I want you to do this week is I want you to rejoice in our living hope. To rejoice in our living hope. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what that is? That is a doxology of praise. Good theology leads to praise. When we understand that Jesus is our living hope, it should move us to worship him and thank him and rejoice in him. Oh, how about verse 6? In this you greatly rejoice. Is that us? Do we greatly rejoice? Oh, and then verse 8. You greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. <laughs> oh, listen, do you, do you see a lot of joy-filled faces around you, do you? 
What an opportunity we have to experience joy and make Christ visible in our culture by following the action step for this week to rejoice in our Lord and our living hope. And you say, how do we do that? Every morning when I get up, I spend time with Jesus. I would highly recommend that to you. And when we spend time with Jesus this week, let's rejoice in our living hope. Oh, Jesus, you are our living hope. And I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that you rose from the grave. And because of that, because of that, our, our failures are not fatal and, and our lives are not futile and our death is not final. Start your day rejoicing. Listen, when you're going through the day, I, I, I hit all the traffic lights red and I'm upset. But what I've learned to do is just rejoice to take the time and the traffic light and rejoice. Jesus, I'm so thankful, so thankful that you're our living hope. And because you rose from the dead, our failures are not fatal and our life is not futile and our death is not final. And, and then as I go through the day and I fail, and I fail a lot, do you? When I fail, I don't promise God I'm gonna do so much better. You know what I do? I rejoice in our living hope. Jesus, I am so thankful that because of you, my failures are not fatal. And then as I go through the life, through my day, and, and I'm overwhelmed by just one wave after another wave after another wave, I rejoice, Jesus, you're my living hope. And because of that, our lives are not futile. You have a purpose for this, Jesus. Help me to make it through. And then when I'm reminded of my death, it's so good to remember, Jesus, you're our living hope, and I rejoice that my death is not final, that the best is yet to come. And you know what'll happen with you? If this week you rejoice over and over again, you know what will happen? Your life will begin to bear the fruit of the Spirit because the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's love, joy. Isn't that? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. And so we, we practice rejoicing. Joy will ex well up inside of us. And will we stand out in our culture today to be a people of joy? Will we? Yes, and we'll stand out for all the right reasons because we're a people of joy. Because you do know what joy is, don't you? J-O-Y. It's Jesus overflowing in you. How can Jesus live in you without coming out of you, right? Oh, so rejoice in our living hope. And as you rejoice, then I really encourage you this week to become a hope dealer. A hope dealer. There's way too many dope dealers in our county, isn't there? But, but what would our county be like if there were thousands of hope dealers? Listen, people are starved for what we know. Their hearts long for hope. How can we keep Jesus to ourselves? The more we give Jesus away, the more we enjoy him ourselves. So let me coach you up a little bit. You, you, you can do this, okay? We live in a canceled culture, right? You know what that means, don't you? That if someone says one wrong word, if someone does one thing wrong, no matter how many good things they've done, they are canceled. They're excommunicated from the end culture. And what's even more sad, there's no way back. There's no way back, right? So this week, when you hear about someone who gets canceled, why not say, I'm so thankful to be a Christian? And people will ask you, why? And you can say, because Jesus is our living hope. And with Jesus, our failures are not fatal. Matter of fact, you have to fail to be a Christian. You have to fail to belong to the church, right? Who can live in a culture where if you fail one time, there's no way back? We have what our culture needs, the hope and the gospel, that our failure is not fatal for those that are in Christ, right? Oh, this week when you're having conversations with you. Won't you have a conversation where someone says, our country is so divided? Or listen, our country is just such a mess. Won't you say, I'm so thankful to be a Christian? I'm thankful, and they'll say, well, why? Because Jesus is our living hope. And with Jesus, any person can change. With Jesus, any family can be put back together. Any community can be changed. There's nothing impossible with Jesus. We have hope to offer hopeless people. This week, maybe you're with someone and, you know, they heard about someone who died from COVID and, and, and they tell you, man, they're afraid. Why not share with them, listen, I am so thankful. I'm so thankful to be a Christian. 
And, and then if they say, well, why? Then you can tell them, because Jesus is our living hope. He rose from the grave. And listen, our death is not final. Listen, being a Christian means we get to live every day of our life believing that the best is yet to come. Wouldn't you like to live life knowing the best is yet to come? Oh, this week, <clears throat> I was going to have breakfast with someone I was discipling this week, and I I turned on Castillo Drive, the, the road that runs by the Visitor Information Center, and there was one of those big signs on the side of the road that flashes messages, and what it said was, be safe, mask up. And what I really wanted, I wish I could have changed the message, because you know what I would have said? Be safe, put on Jesus, because when you put on Jesus, you put on living hope. You put on living hope, and, and that takes care of our past and our present and our future, and having Jesus as our living hope enables us to live each day of our lives with the joyful expectancy that the best is yet to come. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, we are so thankful you came to seek and save sinners like us that you lived and died and rose so that we could have eternal life, forgiveness, that we could do life and eternity with you. And listen, if you're here today and maybe for the first time you've understood the gospel and, and, and you'd like this gift of eternal life, won't you tell Jesus, Jesus, I've sinned against you and I'm sorry. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose. And I want you to come in and be my savior and forgive me and give me eternal life. I want you to be Lord of my life. Help me be the person you want me to be. Oh, if you've prayed that for the first time, won't you mark it on your card? We'd love to celebrate with you. And Lord, I pray for those of who have believed you, who've received this gift, that this week we would rejoice in our living hope, that day after day we would rejoice that our failures are not fatal, we're forgiven, and that our lives are not futile. We get to do life with you. And Lord, that our death is not final. And as we experience your joy and your hope, Lord, give us opportunities to share that with others because there are so many people in this county who desperately searching for hope. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we leave worshiping together. <clears throat>